Hi, it's Tim again. Um, I thought today we'd uh, design a synthesizer preset from scratch. And as elaborate as it is, I'm going to choose to use the Matrix 12 in order to do that. Now there are um, more simpler synthesizers to take you through the fundamentals of uh, sound design, but um, I wanted to take this opportunity to show you through the workflow of the Matrix 12. And you're more than welcome to skip to that section now as I'm going to do a little bit of waffling about this and that as we go. So uh, the first thing is a little bit about me um, doing preset design. I've been designing presets for 10 years now and professionally for maybe eight or so years and I'm on a bit of a hiatus at the moment. And there's a couple of reasons for that. The first is um, I don't really feel like the amount of effort and quality that I'm putting into it is really paying me back. Um, not so much with the professional manufacturer work, that's fine, um, but the independent releases that I would do um, on any given day or week or month, um, I started to take a little bit, take it a little bit too seriously. When I work with manufacturers, um, I do take my time and I work hard on it and I started to integrate that into my independent releases and I don't think that was really the way to go. So um, the last manufacturer I worked with was uh, Novation working on the Novation Summit and the last independent release I did was with the Oberheim, uh, sorry the sequential Oberheim OB6. Um, and since then I've just sort of taken a bit of a step back because I really needed a break from doing all the work that I was doing with synthesizers. Um, that's really the, the first thing. Um, the second thing is that I don't really like the preset market at the moment. I think um, there's a lot of, there, there's so much stuff available out there and a lot of it is low quality. And um, that's at the detriment to the customer where they can't really see the wood from the trees so there's so much stuff out there how can you possibly listen to everything and find what's right for you and what's good quality it's quite quite a challenging task at the moment um, so I'm not quite sure I want to be a part of that um, it's changed a lot in the last 10 years when I started out there was only a couple of people that were really um, selling independently um, the rest of the sound designers out there were working, I suppose, directly with manufacturers at that time. So the, the landscape has completely changed and I'm not sure I want to be a part of it at the moment, but we'll see. The last thing and most important reason for the current hiatus is that I simply don't have the time to um, do any presets at the moment. And that's come down to a couple of different things. Uh, change in circumstance, um, COVID weirdly has affected it. Um, so yeah, time time is a major issue. Uh, so it would have to be an incredibly exciting synthesizer or artist that I was gonna work with to take me out of this hiatus. So I'm, I'm not saying it's definitely not gonna happen, but um, things would have to be, you know, the plans would have to align and have to be really special. Um, but that's just that's just the way it is at the moment and things can change. So um, let's talk about the Oberheim Matrix 12 and why I bought it. I think the first thing to talk about is vintage synthesizers as a, as a whole and the fact that they are an incredibly good investment if you choose the right ones and it's quite obvious which the right ones are. Um, I do not recommend taking out a loan to pay for a synthesizer because um, you could find yourself paying more on interest than you might make in profit when you eventually sell the instrument. So I um, wouldn't recommend doing that. Um, I was fortunate enough to be in a position to pay for the Matrix 12 up front but believe me when I did that I was scrambling to sell other gear to put the money back in the bank as soon as I did that and I'm also putting back in the bank what little disposable income I have to finish up paying for this and it's you know it's 80 percent there um, so I've still got some money to pay myself back on but 
I was in the position that I could um, not have to sell the gear first, you know. Um, so interest free, let's say, and that's that's really the way to do it. Why a Matrix Twelve in particular? Well, um, I bought and sold a lot of synthesizers in my time. And as a sound designer, the key thing for me is modulation. And the Matrix 12 just has that in abundance. We've got, I'm not gonna go through all the specs because that's not what I'm about um, in terms of creating content. Um, but we've got five envelopes, five LFOs. We've got, I think, maybe five ramps which are similar to envelopes or LFOs. You can program them in different ways and make them behave in different ways. Um, and they can probably re-trigger, but don't quote me on that. And then a tracking generator as well, which is just, it is invaluable to me as a preset designer. Um, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, so that was the first thing, a lot of modulation required uh, in what I do and what I really like to get out of synthesizers. And in terms of what I'm doing with synthesizers at the moment, it's just having fun. So I wanted to remain being creative um, with what I had in my collection. Um, and the Matrix 12 is a way to do that. I have other synthesizers that will cater for other things such as pure quality of sound like the the Micro Moog, which maybe I'll do a video on at some point, is just just an amazing, pure, solid, vintage oscillator tone. It's incredible, as is the filter on that thing. Um, and it's more, um, independently, I feel, has a more impressive raw sound than maybe the Oberheim does here. However, why a Matrix 12 over an expander? And that again comes down to creativity. The Matrix 12 has six more voices than the Expander. And because of the things that you can do with the Matrix 12 and Expander, those extra voices are incredibly valuable. Having a multiple patch um, with by timbal, a, a by timbal patch basically, you need as many voices as you can to make that really work. And on an Expander, using two presets together you only end up having three voices if that's the way you want to play it you know you could have a you could have six sounds play at once but it would be monophonic you see you're using the six voices in lots of different ways so the more voices the better um, when I, I I was originally getting serious about a matrix 12 in maybe 2017 um, I was starting to look then and starting to get serious about coughing up the, the money for one and um, they never really showed up not really at the price that I was willing to pay for them and the general rule of thumb is that you shouldn't pay um, more than two the cost of two expanders for a matrix 12 you just shouldn't do that it's it's not really worth it it's not as if you can I don't think you can daisy chain an expander so you couldn't get 12 voices out of an expander but you could kind of treat set an expander up to kind of do similar things that the matrix 12 would offer you so uh, it just they didn't really show up they're quite it's quite rare for them to be available or and even rarer for there to be more than one option of a matrix 12 out there but i was looking and you know 2020 2021 rolled around and I was looking at expanders, you know, I was getting a bit like, well, I'm just going to have to, I don't have the money for the what Matrix 12s are going for. Maybe I'll sit back and take a, an expander. And, you know, just as I was looking around um, for an expander, a Matrix 12 popped up and uh, the seller and I had some long conversations about it and eventually we agreed on a price. Um, so I was lucky to be in a position that he was the right person to be talking to and he listened to what I had to say about the value and there was absolutely no bullshit involved with it. It was just a, it was a good transaction. Um, generally it's in really great condition. You can see the chip in the key down there. Um, and there's a minor indentation somewhere, <laughs> somewhere along up here. And like most 
Matrix 12s and Expanders, you know, the panel isn't what it used to be, the surface of the panel, um, because I think it's some sort of weird coating that they put on the panel, and as soon as you start cleaning it, it starts to rub away. And that's why you see, occasionally you see really, really shiny Expanders and really, really shiny Matrix 12s, and that's because somebody's cleaned them too hard, and that protective surface has been removed. Um, so not ideal to go for those ones, um, but they should be cheaper. A lot of the time, in fact most of the time, they aren't, they're selling at the same price, but it's the matte ones you really want to try and get hold of the, the good as gold. Um, another thing to consider in terms of uh, Matrix 12s and Expanders is where they were built and I'll probably get some comments about this but really the US built um, Expander or Matrix 12 is the one to go for. Some were built in Japan and I understand the power supplies to be and the wiring looms in the Japan models to be a little bit um, hit and miss. So best to get a US one if you can. Um, they do. There's a company out there I forget their name that make a replacement power supply for a Matrix 12. Um, but this one ain't broke, so I'm not going to fix it. Same with everything else. If it's not broke, I don't fix it. Um, you could argue that it's be pre preventative, but um, it's fine as it is. So. I'm, I'm not concerned about it. So yeah, it's about um, being an investment, being um, <laughs> really capable, sounding great. I first saw one of these, um, you know, I first became aware of the expander because of uh, Orbital, who were my, and probably still are my favorite group. Um, Paul Hartnell was using it a lot and also Vince Clark because I liked the way Erasure sounded as well and then I saw a Matrix 12 obviously because of Arturia um, their VST model of it and I I demoed that for a while and under and you know suddenly understood how capable it was and it's just how much modulation and, and the routing is just excellent and I don't I will we'll have a look at the workflow in a little bit but I don't find the workflow to be that hard. You know, in terms of cutting costs, um, they they did a good job of making up for the fact that they cut costs with all the, the lack of um, pots and sliders and faders and whatever. You know, that's the reason it's, it's quite sparse. It's just a cost-cutting exercise. But the workflow does kind of make up for that and you're only really hitting one or two more extra buttons to get to where you want to go it's it's very intuitive and if after a while of using it there's a good amount of muscle memory that comes in to uh, working with it so that's uh that's the matrix 12 really okay so i've got my matrix 12 here laid out in front of you um, the crop is a little bit tight, but beyond here, there's there's nothing to see really. So don't worry about. It. I mean, there's levers here, but you know what levers do. You know, pitch bend and modulation. So I'm not too worried about that. Um, so what do I do when I start making a preset? I start with a basic patch or a default patch or an initiated patch. They're different things on different synthesizers. Some synthesizers have um, a button combo that you can do to get yourself to a initialized patch. And you may have seen a video by the head of European Korg. I forget his name and I've worked with him, so that's awful. But um, he did something for the Red Bull Academy, which is your first preset on the Matrix 12. and. Really, that's not... <laughs> arguably, yes, that's the first preset because um, it's the first thing I will do and I will save across a synthesizer, but it isn't really a first preset. It's sort of just your default sound is what he really meant. So some synthesizers have a button that you can get to that sound. Other synthesizers, you just have to create it yourself. And 
when when I'm designing a preset, I don't really want to start with somebody else's preset. Um, that's really the job of the customer. The customer can um, use presets, factory presets as a springboard. And when I'm designing factory presets, that's exactly what I have in mind. You know, I'm going to design sounds that have to be playable. You have to be able to play them um, <clears throat> and enjoy playing them. I don't tend to make wacky sounds that are sort of one note key hit wonders. Um, I want to. I prefer more sort of keyboard orientated sounds that you can really enjoy playing. Um, <clears throat> so a basic preset on a Matrix Twelve um, is what I would do. I'd dial up a sound. This sound. That's your sort of basic preset sound. I'm not sure the Matrix Twelve, as I say, has a button combo to get there. But this is the sound I will design. It's, it's pretty basic. I'll hit VCO1 <clears throat> um, and the pitch is at tw a course 12 um, and it's I think it's on a sawtooth down here. Um, I could select pulse if I wanted to and deselect sawtooth because you can have combos here. Um, but generally you start with just one VCO on VCO2, if I was to switch there, you'll see the volume is at zero. So the volume is at 63 on VCO1. I'll have the filter all the way open, so 127 on this particular synth is all the way open. And uh, then in terms of the envelopes, I press the envelope button here, and then I've got a choice of one to five envelopes, so I'll choose envelope one. And envelope one currently is assigned to the VCF. So uh, I've got no attack on it and no release. So that means when I press a note, it's sort of acting like a gate. The, the note is on or off. So on and then off. Um, same thing with the envelope two, which is currently, I mean, you're, you're not actually gonna see a difference there because uh, you can see it down here, envelope one, envelope two, but they're both the same. They're sort of either on or off and that's, that's it. Um, the only other thing to say about a basic preset is that uh, there's no modulation with it at all. So there's no LFOs um, messing around with anything. There's no vibrato, that sort of thing. Um, the, the pitch level probably has something assigned to it. Yeah, just a basic, uh, I think it's two semitones up on that. And then the mod, mod wheel. Yeah, the mod wheel has nothing assigned to it at the moment, but typically that might be vibrato or something like that. Um, <clears throat> actually, because of the way that we have aftertouch on this particular keyboard and all the pedal inputs and that sort of stuff, very, very rarely would I uh, even use the, the mod wheel. Uh, in fact, I don't think I've ever used it on this synth. I know it works, or do I? Anyway, it doesn't really matter. Um, so that's my basic preset. <laughs> And it doesn't matter what synthesizer I'm using, I'll dial that up in whichever way, and then I will save that one default preset across all of the patch banks. So the entire memory will just be this one sound. Because then I know that um, the sounds that I'm designing are my sounds, you know. Um, <clears throat> I don't think it's a bad idea to... Um, have sounds that you've heard of from film and TV and your favorite music to develop sounds like that. But um, to just straight out copy, this is the sound from Blue Monday or this is the sound from Voodoo People. <clears throat> I mean, that's, uh, I, I don't see the value in that. I know people are happy to buy them, so they probably sell well, but in terms of um, what I get out of designing presets, I find it much more satisfactory if I start from scratch and develop something that's totally new to me and everybody else. Okay, so the way I design a preset from scratch like this um, could be in any number of ways. It could be that I've designed just designed five base presets and now I want to do a lead or um, 
I've done bases and leads and pads and now I think it's time to do an arpeggiator. Uh, this doesn't have an arpeggiator but I'm just giving you an example of why I might chop and change and I might deliberately make a sound. But a lot of the time I've got no idea what I want to do next. And so I will just mess around with the sound of the synthesizer, the parameters of the synthesizers and see if I can find myself a starting point. And from then I'll get an idea of where the sound needs to go. And that's what I'm going to do today. I have no, literally no idea what sound we're going to do. It will be playable. It won't be any crazy sound effects, at least not yet. We'll get to that later. One thing I should talk about is that we're in single patch mode. So we're just going to design a single preset for now. We'll move on to multi patch later when we start layering things up. But this is just a single patch mode. So it's a similar way of working. <coughs> um, let's say if you had a Jupiter 6 or any sort of 12 voice polyphonic synthesizers with two VCOs that wasn't um, by Timbal. So um, the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to have a little listen through uh, the VCO and see if we can um, get a sound that's pleasing to the ear that I want to start working with. So we're in sawtooth mode now but let's have a listen to some of the other waveforms whilst we're here. Um, so let's take out saw so when I, when I press the key now, you get nothing. With triangle, with pulse, we can go back to page one of the VCO one and mess around with the pulse width. Yeah, I think 31 is um, square. Or we could do a combination of both of these. Uh, and to be honest, I quite like that, but I might just mess around with the pulse width a little bit more. Okay, interesting. Um, so I'd probably mess around with it a little bit more, but for the sake of this video, I'll leave it there for now. Um, what I might typically then move on to is the filter and see if we can get like the first sort of uh, round that off a bit and um, see where we can take it from there. So. Now I'm thinking why the hell isn't that making any changes? And um, what would be the answer to that? The answer is that the envelope is all the way open. So there's no decay with the frequency. So, um, or the sustain is all the way high. So once I go to the envelope, this is just a way of set up the basic preset. I've tricked myself. There we go. So uh, once the envelope opens and then the decay kicks in and uh, brings it back down again. The decay is quite long, but it will take the filter to zero because it's set at zero initially, but we, we're amplifying that filter by 63 and the decay makes it quite long. So it sounds currently sounds like this. And it will take ages to decay. So if I just roll that back, that's how it sounds. But that's not what I want to do. Um, what I want to do is open that up a little bit. Open this up a little bit. Um, turn this down so we're, we're not really having the envelope effect of the filter so much. So we'll open it up and we'll see if we can find an area of the filter that's pleasing for this particular sound. I can hear there's this clicking going on in there and that's because we've got the attack all the way um, to zero and the envelope all the way and the, sorry the release all the way to zero so what I want to do is just open those up a fraction and I'm going to do that on both the filter and the uh, VCA envelopes. Too much attack now. So 
move. Now I'm going to mess about with the filter a little bit more to find that sweet spot I'm looking for. I don't know what that is yet. <laughs> back to the VCO and tweak the pulse width because I'm not all that keen on it. Just just that little change is soften things up a little bit. So now we've got <clears throat> the envelope really isn't affecting the filter so much but this is basically whereabouts I want that filter to, to end up. Maybe down there. Where do I want the filter to start? Let's have a listen. Right, so now I'm going to open up the release on both envelopes so we can sustain the note and really have a listen to how it's performing. So what modulation do we currently have on the frequency? Uh, envelope 1, we know this. We've been using envelope 1 to modulate the filter so far. But uh, uh, a dedicated switch you might see on some synthesizers is called key or key tracking or whatever. Um, and that is to say, uh, depending on where we play on the keyboard, the filter is going to be open uh, to a certain amount and typically down at the bottom your filter will be slightly more closed than at the top the filter will be slightly uh, will be more open and you can flip reverse that if you so wish so it's it's softer at the top and uh, much brighter at the bottom but um, you'll see what I did there I pressed the filter button to go to the filter page and then press the button beneath frequency which is our filter um, variance and then it takes us into the modulation page and from here I'm going to select keyboard and I'm going to crank that up and what you'll notice now is that it's as we were down there I suppose but up here it's way brighter if we turn tone that down a little bit we'll try and hear what it does so we can, as I say, we can put it into minus figures, so it's softer up the top, and arguably not any brighter at the bottom. <laughs> I think it's just uh, pushed this down as well. But there's 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 things you can do about that, such as tracking. Um, we'll talk about tracking in a little bit. But yeah, so the brighter you play. Uh, sorry, the higher you play, the brighter the filter is going to be. And because we're adding this in now, we actually need to compensate by turning the frequency down and going to the uh, the envelope, which is having an effect on the filter as well, and bring that down too. Start, have to start playing it to really see how it sounds because you might do that and it sounds one way but when you start playing it in the real world it's sounding slightly different let's increase the release time again a little bit too much there um, common trick I will do as well is to have a short 
very short decay on the VCA. Um, and, and then bring the sustain down. And now what that does is, so your the volume of the entire preset for you know 95% of the time you have a key pressed down in this case um, will will be at a certain level but the first you know 5% will be a lot louder and that gives you a, a, a heavy heavier impact when you first press the note so if I bring this down you'll hear And that, and that um, effect doesn't have to be that drastic, but the more you crank up the volume and have the sustain come down, you'll have a real punch to the start of your sound, and that just that's um, that's one way of um, dealing with the sonics of the sound. I'm going to turn it up, but basically. You can't really notice that, but it's there and it does have an effect on the overall sonics and it's, it's a key component I'll use a lot. It's almost like how compression works. I'm sort of using the envelope to emulate compression where you have something that comes in so loud that it suddenly ducks down. Um, <clears throat> and that's a key component to my sound design a lot of the time. Um, another key component to my sound design, I know we're not um, messing around too much with the fundamental of the way the sounds is at the moment, um, but we're building onto it. Um, another key component is a very, very slow LFO on the VCO, so that the pitch wobbles ever so slightly, and that gives you the impression that you have an old vintage analog synthesizer that needs tuning. And again, it has to be very subtle for it to work quite well. So let's go to VCO1. We'll go to the frequency of VCO1. <clears throat> We've also already, as a default in the patch that I've created, we already have LFO1 assigned to VCO1. So all I need to do is increase the amount there. But obviously that's mad and no one wants to listen to that. But I've basically programmed in some soft vibrato. But that's not really what I was talking about. Um, I'm talking about having a much slower LFO, so I've pressed LFO, I'm going to go to LFO1 and speed it, uh, reduce the speed down. So you can hear now that the LFO is a lot slower. And that's not a million miles away from where one. I think it's still too strong to be subtle. So I'll just roll it back a bit. Yeah, it's got more life to it now and that's really what we're looking for we're looking to build more life into the sound um, but there's no real playability right now and what I mean by that is when you're playing this thing you're not there's no expression in it. <coughs> so what we want to do is introduce um, some velocity modulation to the filter and the VCA so again I'm in VCA I'm gonna click on frequency um, and I'm going to click on velocity and I'm going to turn this up and again when I do this it's often it affects the overall quality of the filter or the filter position that I have open because now suddenly it's down to the pressure I hit the keys at that determines how wide the filter is open and that can really have a detrimental effect on um, where I had previously positioned that filter it's not too bad See, the harder I hit the key, the, the brighter the, the note. So now it's, it's definitely having an effect on um, the starting position of the filter. So I'm going to turn it down on envelope one. So we, we, our 
I've found a balance now where when I play softly So yeah, now we have um, introducing expression to the sound. I'm going to do exactly the same with the VCA. <clears throat> I'm going to turn it down so the overall volume level is quieter, but we're going to introduce velocity. So the softer we play, the quieter the sound, as well as the duller the filter. The harder I hit it, the louder we're going to get as well. Still think it's too bright with the velocity. Just gonna roll that back a bit. So you get it, you get it now, right? You get that we're building expression into the sound, we're tweaking the sound as we go, um, and you know, this this isn't um, where we are now, isn't too far from where I would normally be in terms of building a sound up. So yes, yeah, it's, it's going all right so far. So that, those are really the fundamentals of um, that's the foundations of sound that I have and now it's really for me um, sorry I'm just <laughs> I get distracted um, now really for me it's about thickening the sound up because this is a cool sound well at least I think it's cool and this is the thing about uh, preset design this is incredibly subjective what I like you might absolutely hate and that's uh, I don't mind Cool thing about a Matrix 12, and something that I deliberately stripped back before I started doing this video, is the panning. Um, some synths do this, or you could easily program a synth to do this uh, if it's got the right modulation, and that's to pan the sound from left to right. But with the, um, so, and I'm not saying attaching an LFO to the pan, I'm talking about each note you play. Uh, plays in a different field and you can do that in the matrix 12 by going to the master page when you're in a single patch go to the master page and there's a pan option down here so it's basically saying from voice 1 to 6 and then 7 to 12 where in the sound field is this going to be so typically I'll start voice uh, 1 off being in the middle and voice 2 I will put for example to the right uh, voice 8, I basically start switching and doing the opposite on the second page. So then I'll go maybe like left 2, right 2, keep that in the middle, and then 
I will go uh, right two, left two, and then maybe left and right there, for example. So now you're going to hear this sound sort of move around the field. I don't know whether the Arturia VST enables you to do that. There's probably some way for you to forge it, but um, there is definitely a difference. Um, and you'll probably ask, well, why didn't I just do that in the first instance? Because it sounds so much better having it move about the sound field. But I just wanted you to hear the, the, the um, standard sound first. But we're, we're going to leave it there. Other things up here which are worth talking about is the tune page. You've got your, um, you can transpose it down. You've got a master tune. Um, you can <coughs> choose up here whether to, to tune your VCOs. And this is sort of like a calibration of the VCOs, the pulse width, the resolution, uh, the, sorry, the resonance, the filter, the VCA, or do them all at once. Um, we tend to stay off that page. I'm not, uh, you know. I have the fear, but I, I did press all the other day and it passed, but I do have the fear that one day I'll press all and something won't pass <laughs> and it will be like, shit, now I've got to send it out to the tech. Anyway, so that's the tune page. Master page, and we're talking about single mode in master page. We um, A chain isn't like polychaining. I believe it's um, where you cycle through sounds. Um, Oh man, I don't really want to get into all of this. You've got your MIDI options. You've got some MISC, which is uh, the velocity scale. So I can set like how sensitive the velocity is. At the moment, it's really sensitive because that's I, I've set it up the way I like it. Um, Pan, we just spoke about. There's a a um, hard coded vibrato in the matrix 12 so you don't have to use any one of the five lfos you you just have a dedicated lfo for vibrato <laughs> but we already have our lfo I don't want this. Uh, once you set this in master, it applies to any other preset that you then move on to. So I tend to have it off um, because otherwise when I move on to my next preset, it's already on and I get confused. Um, then you've got a voice assigned mode, zone, sorry. <coughs> and that only really applies to, um, well actually let's have a look at it. Yeah, it would, I think this is really only going to apply to a single, um, sorry, multi-patch, because if I assign voice one to zone two, and zone two is probably somewhere else, so it might not fire. Uh, no, what you'll see here is that uh, voice one in zone two is actually firing at the same time as every other voice. So in zone two it would seem that uh, voice one is kind of messing around monophonically but we can change that in a in the sub bank down in zone zones down there um but it's you know it's it's it makes more sense to muck about with that when we're in multi-mode um so that is a uh, bit of a tangent so we've got a, a sort of a basic sound, we've got some expression going on with that as well. So uh, the next thing to really do is thicken it up. And that's where I, why I went on the tangent, because uh, to thicken it up, I just sort of moved it around the, um, the audio field. That was my first thing to do. 
The second thing for me to do is to bring in VCO2. So let's do that. You can barely hear it. Now you can hear it, right? Let's bring it down to the same frequency again. And what we'll just do is we'll use the fine tune to kind of thicken up the sound as a whole. So you get the idea, let's have a look at the, um, it's on a sawtooth at the moment. Am I cool with that? I think I'm cool with that, yeah. You'll notice up here we have some options, um, it's just probably the same for VCO1. Um, if I switch keyboard off, the keyboard pressing a note won't affect or won't fire the VCO. We can talk about lag another time because it's. I, I don't think I've got my head around that completely yet. Um, level one means um, one of the levers over here will affect the pitch bend. So let's uh, let's demonstrate that. So it's currently switched on, as is it on VCO one. So when I use the pitch lever, both VCOs uh, respond to that. But I turn that one off, and you'll hear. Only VCO1 is then responding. Vibrato, so we were talking about the vibrato up here. Um, when the vibrato is on, um, when the vibrato is turned up, then it is going to respond on VCO2 and VCO1. And then we've got sync, so we can sync VCO2 to VCO1. And whilst we're here, let's have a listen. So obviously that sort of knocks VCO2 out for now. And the reason is that they're both at the same pitch and there's no real hard syncing going on. They're not really um, reacting to each other because they're in the same frequency. So what we would need to do now is go back to page one of VCO2. Now we've got the hard sync on and start messing around with the frequency. So typically when I'm designing a sound, I'll try all these different things just to see how they sound, you know? Back to the filter. Typically hard sync sounds better when the filter's a little bit further open, but let's uh, use the envelope to achieve that. As the sound evolves, I start messing around with everything I've already created, and that's where you start getting, going down the rabbit hole. this is now done as it means we don't have uh, sound as thick because once you put it in hard sync mode the detune doesn't sort of put the sound the the um, the pitches out of whack with each other because um, hard sync is completely different to two tones so for example if we go back it's much more subtle but I'm going to leave hard sync on actually because I want to then demonstrate what we can do in multi mode. <clears throat> so we can still thicken it up. We'll come back to that later and we'll leave um, we'll leave it on sync there. But I might just see if there's a better sort of tone for that. In some cases,
cases, different pulse width, uh, different a different pulse width would make, would react slightly differently and make it sound another way entirely. Um, what I'm now going to do actually is add an envelope to wherever we were, the frequency, so the pitch of VCO2. I'm going to add an envelope to it. Um, we've already we're already using envelope one and two, so let's not me me mess about with that again. Um, so I press envelope and I'll say envelope three because we're not using that one just yet. Go to envelope three and turn the sustain all the way down. So when the envelope closes down to zero, um, the frequency of VCO2 is as we left it. The problem here is what I've forgotten to do is actually turn it up on the VCO2 itself. So you'll hear now it starts up quite bright and when we lift off um, it closes down again, the frequency closes down. Can you hear that? The way to remedy that is to add some release. pretty wild and I don't want it that wild so I'm gonna like rein it in a bit still pretty wacky um, so I'm gonna knock it down to a finishing point around here. That's so much better. So much better. Yeah. Um, not sure about the resonance right now. I just put it in this place at the time and it sounded right, but I'm gonna just roll it back and see if, it, if I prefer it. With sync, it's better up further up like that. There's different uh, filter modes as well that I should mention, and I don't, I don't um, use them that often. But when I do, I really like what happened, <laughs> so I don't use them enough. But there's um, some phase. Let's do a three pole phase and have a listen. <laughs> So three phase and low. Let's see if we can knock that down. I like it, but not enough to keep it. Look at that. So now, obviously, with all that testing, I've chucked it out of uh, whack. I mean, we could visit FM if you like. Um, so we have a frequency modulator amp, and don't ask me exactly how this operates. I just listen to how it sounds. Um, the destination you can set is: will the FM amp affect VCO one, or will it affect the filter? And we'll have a listen to how both of that, uh, both of those work. <laughs> The trouble with an FM amp is that, generally speaking, you need to be on the pulse width. And 
I think we are on VCO1, aren't we? But I'm going to set it to the filter and see how that sounds. You know, where we are at the moment with this particular sound, it's not going to bring out uh, the best in the VC, uh, the, the FM amp. Um, if I start changing the frequency of VCO1, it will, but then we'll lose what we've done so far. Um, yeah, I'm a little bit cautious about doing that. Let's try it anyway. We know it's at 12. The other thing is that we've got VCO2 sync to VCO1, so the whole FM thing just might not work today. See, now it's working because I've taken the sync off. Um, and then also we've got that envelope affecting VCO2. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm taking steps back here. This isn't a great idea. You can hear it coming in there, coming into effect. It's more bell-like. Quite nice. I'm raining back in the D tune because when you start pushing it out with FM, it, um, distort isn't quite the right word, but it does really mess with the quality of it. But I am liking this. Let's go with it. I don't, I'm not so bothered about having gone all the way back on it now. because what I want to do is basically stack this sound up twice and um, fine we'll just do it we'll just we'll just continue as we are I like it um, another thing to just quickly talk about is <clears throat> you may have noticed on these envelopes that we have a delay function and uh, that is there to say when you hit the note we're gonna have X amount of time before the envelope actually uh, starts kicking in. And what that's good for is, if you remember on envelope three, um, envelope three was changing the pitch to VCO2, but we turned it off. Let's bring it back in ever so slightly. So what you'll hear is this. If we Let's put it all the, all the way up. It's no longer sync, but the FM is making it a little bit wacky let's rein it in but okay no let's keep it there and <laughs> demonstrate the delay so now I hit a note and it's not going to do that I roll it back keep and then you hear it just about kicks in so So we've got a little bit of variance 
pits with the pits of VCO2 playing with VCO1 so that's adding some more sonics and some more sort of um, you know some more creativity to everything that we're doing at the moment and that's sounding pretty good um cool so i might make some further tweaks just before i commit having said that i haven't saved this at any point yet so the simple thing to do would be to save it so we don't lose it so you press store and then go for 43 you have to press and hold down store and now it's stored in 43 so if we go up to 44 it's another basic preset back to 43 and we as we were thank goodness <clears throat> um so yeah still not happy with the way that's rolling cool um let's talk about tracking now um Tracking is wonderful, and uh, I, off the top of my head, this is the only synth I've ex uh, encountered this on. Let me explain how it works. I'll go to VCO1, and I will modulate VCO1, and I will set the track uh, set the second modular modular modulator to be track one. Let's crank that all the way up uh, I'm not sure you're going to hear a difference yeah you definitely are <clears throat> but I'm going to so I'm going to put it to let, well let's just crank it all the way up so that I can demonstrate this I'll go to track 1 now and press track 1 I think earlier in the video I said we had 5 um, <clears throat> five of these but we got three instead so the input of this tracking is the keyboard so when we press the keyboard that's what's um, triggering these these trackings and this tracking is affecting the pitch of VCO1 right at the moment it's linear it's going from point 1 and we can say that point 1 is around about here is 0 Point two is around about here, point three is around about here, point four is around about here, point five is around about here on the keyboard. And the increase is linear. What we can do is we can completely invert that. And this is what I was talking about the filter earlier, is that um, for whatever reason when we're doing keyboard tracking and we, in, we, and we put it into minus figures, uh, it wasn't making the bottom half of the keyboard any brighter but we could fix that up here so we could say we can modulate the filter using tracking so that it's at its brightest point in point one and so yeah we could sort of make it linear in an inverted way but we can also you know make it um, all sorts of different anywhere around in the keyboard and this is what I kind of do with the pitch so the you know we've added fm so it's not going to be uh, the best demonstration for this but i would use i would assign tracking to the vco1 pitch so wherever you play in the keyboard the pitch is ever so slightly different combine that with a slow lfo on um, vco1 pitch and you're getting all sorts of different pitch inconsistencies again with VCO1 pitch you could apply the velocity so the harder you hit the key the different uh, a different pitch would come out so there's so many different things you can assign to uh, VCO1 pitch that will uh, change the, the pitch itself and that's how you start to get a really organic sound and a slightly more unpredictable pitch every time you hit the note. It doesn't have to be way out there, it can be really subtle, but that's how you start introducing thickness and, and to a sound and a more sort of analog vibe. And that's what you will hear from um, some of the Dave Smith instruments had slop on them and some of them have like a dial, I think, which is vintage and you turn that up. That's effectively what it's doing is sort of adding inconsistencies to your filter and your pitch. So I'm just using pitch as one example where I could assign all these different um, modulations to slightly affect the, 
the um, the filter on every note strike. But yeah, so that's basically what tracking does. It enables you to select a portion of the keyboard. In this particular instance, you can have it assigned to all sorts of bloody things like the pressure. So the harder, so the midpoint of the pressure, you could bring it all the way up here. So let's um, maybe let's give that a go. So the midpoint of the pressure is here. If I press it harder, it should get. <laughs> I've got a funny. There you go. It comes back down. Midpoint and off. So this is our midpoint. Off. Up. Pressure and off. So we can assign that to, to air pressure or we can assign it to keyboard, which is traditionally what I would do to introduce strange inconsistencies. Then I'm going to store the preset. And then we'll come back. One thing that I've completely forgotten about is I want to store this preset in two spaces. And I'll explain why in a little bit. So uh, 43 and 44. Um, We'll come back and then we'll start doing work on the multi-patch. So I'm going to switch over to multi-mode. And what that does is it sort of kicks things into a different space. And um, because I'm not in there all that often, I, get, I, I, I sometimes get a little bit confused. But um, yeah, so when you're in multi-mode, uh, as default, these buttons do something else um, until you select one of 12 voices. In multi-mode, uh, all of these suddenly become independent voices. Uh, I am going to try and find a basic patch in multi-mode. Right. So each of these are its own voice. So when you select one, then you can start using these buttons in the traditional way. So um, let's go to the sound that we dialed up. <clears throat> so what's going to happen now is voice, I think, I think we're currently on voice seven, um, is going to be our preset. So we'll cycle through and you'll see this happen. There's a little dot here. I know um, it's a little bit blown out in terms of contrast, but that's just what we have to put up with. But there's a little dot here. It's a little dot that references each piece, each uh, voice. So that was voice two. We're now in voice three. Uh, this is the way we set up the Matrix 12 currently. There are other options, but we're in a rotate mode. So every time you hit a note, it will play the next voice, rather than, I think, reset mode, which will continually play voice one unless you're playing additional notes anyway so we're now in voice four five six that was six so actually I think where I started was somewhere else I think I was starting at voice eight nine ten eleven twelve one two three four and eventually we got to voice seven which was my preset so you'll hear it's rotating through but we could set um, voice eight to be I don't know ten demonstrating how this is working to you. So we can assign lots and lots of different voices. Um, but we can also make all of these play at the same time by assigning them to different key zones. So if I uh, click multi-patch again, it will bring us back into this uh, separate menu. And we can go to uh, mm, voice assign. 
and we can say voice 7 is zone 2, voice 8 is zone 3, 9 is 4, 10 is 5, we go to 6. So we can have, I think, probably do even more than that. But what I'm getting at is they're all now playing at the same time. Obviously it sounds terrible and this is why you want to be careful about what uh, presets you put up in here. Um, <clears throat> traditionally what I will do is if I come out of here and um, we just start from scratch again. Traditionally what I'll do you can press and hold and select multiple ones at the same time. Um, so now I've got voice 1 to 6 selected, I'm going to make that voice 43 and come back down to voices 7 and 12 and now 7 and 12 are selected so I'm going to choose 44. You'll remember that we saved the same preset to slot 43 and 44 but um, whilst we're here I suppose um, let's select the zone of 7 to 8 to be zone 2 and what that will mean is that um, we have we now have six voices a six voice polyphonic synthesizer which is by Timbal so when I press one note voices 1 and 7 will play at the same time but you don't hear a difference because it's the same preset, right? But the only thing that we're going to change is uh, voice 44 rather than 43. And again, I will explain, you know, we could have 43 over here as well. And we can change all of these independently. So we can load up 43 in every single voice and we can change just voice 1 of 43. So we can detune all of these voices again separately so that there's inconsistencies in pitch or just have difference in filters or all sorts of different things. We can use the same preset but we can tweak that preset in 12 different spaces but there is a reason that I have um, got it in two different places and that reason is <clears throat> that when it comes to saving you can't save multiple um, highlights so I can only save 44 from this one space. I can only save 44 from this space, or this space, or this space, or this space. But I can't highlight them all together and save them. Because it thinks, oh, I've got changes in all of these. How am I possibly going to save all those different changes? Which, which of these am I going to choose to save in space 44? because all of the multiple patches are saved in the single patch memory. There is multi-patch multi memory, but that's really just remembering which of the single patches it's bringing up. So I don't know whether I've explained that <clears throat> quite right, but um, in order to create a multi-patch um, using a, the same preset, we've got to save it in two different spaces so that we make our changes to voice 7 to 12 and can save that without overriding 43. Um, and that's something you've got to remember. It's really hard once you've created a preset to realise, oh, um, I've made so many different changes in this multi and I can't save it. That's a massive drawback of the Matrix 12 and probably the Expander as well. Um, that you can't, you've got to be careful how you operate because you may find that you've created this amazing preset and it, you cannot save it. I'll demonstrate that. I'll highlight these three and I'll try and store it and it will say editing multiple voices can't store. So you can only highlight one and store it. So you better be sure that you've got enough spaces to highlight all these different ones. So yeah, bit of a drawback, but once you know how it works, you can avoid that. So anyway, uh, voice one to six is 43, and voice seven to 12 is voice seven to eight. And I've highlighted seven to eight, and we're gonna edit, edit seven to eight all together so that all of the, these independent sounds are gonna be edited the same at the same time. 
the simple thing for me to do would be to change the pitch of VCO1 on, on these. So let's see how that works. <laughs> That's all right, it's quite nice down the lower end. Once you get up here, this, this pitch is too much. So I'll bring it back down. That's quite nice. Again, on still on 44, I'm going to change the BCO2, see how that reacts. And let's introduce some vibratos. Ah, yes, yeah, see, this is another thing. When you're in this mode, again, it's saying that you've got multi, you've only got a limited amount of LFOs, and that has to stretch over um, various different um, presets that you've loaded up. So I would have to change the LFO on one um, single instance and then save that preset again for it to work. So let's go back to 44. Let's get, we've only got one save, um, one highlighted, but once we save this one, it will apply to all of these. So, little, and the reason for this, I think, is that it's, it's got something to do with the processing power, as I understand it. Um, the Matrix 12 has limited processing power, and in order to, if it was to change the LFO on all of these together, um, it would struggle and it could even crash. So I think they put it in the design to sort of limit that a little bit. That's my understanding, I could be wrong about that. Anyway, let's, um, we haven't touched LFO2 in this video yet, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna select VCO1. Um, we're gonna introduce this to be LFO2. Do the same on VCO2 because we know that they're talking to each other and we don't wanna put it out of whack. So LFO2, bring it up to 63 so that we can hear what it's doing. So all the way to the max. But herein lies the next problem. We can't hear that until we actually hit that one particular voice. So we're gonna to have to cycle through it. There it is. So what I have to do now is store this um, in order for it to save it and then we can use it across all of these 44s. It's annoying, I'm not gonna lie. That is now stored, so when I now bring up 44 here, I think it should apply to all of these voices. I bloody hope so. Yeah, right, so it does. I've done the right thing. But it's really only modulation that you have to do that for. When it comes to the filter, fine. We can mess about with that on all of all uh, six of these independent voices. But when it comes to modulation, no, we have to do it on one and then save it, and then it will apply to all of them. So yeah, not great. But um, <coughs> this was Oberheim's way around dealing with low processing power, which is just was just a limitation of the day. You can't blame it. This is the sort of thing that you just have to put up with with vintage equipment.
it either sounds really good or you buy something modern day which doesn't sound quite as good but has um, more processing power and probably less modulation than this baby. So I am more than happy to put up with the nuances like that, it's just a part of it. Even though we have to kind of apply changes to just one of these at a time, you can then go back into the envelope and roll it back. I don't think I really explained that to you. Um, it's really the assigning of modulation to a particular parameter that is limited when you're highlighting more than one preset but you can then go back to the envelopes or the LFOs and then roll it back. So it's just about the, the process of assigning it. It's, it's difficult. sounds like when I make voice 44 into a pad. Okay. <clears throat> I bloody love that. And this is what uh, you need to be doing. It's just messing around with things until you find what you really, really like. It, but I want to hear that LFO a little bit more now. I've changed my mind. got an issue where I like the LFO on 44 but I don't want it to come in straight away <clears throat> so I want to change the amplitude I want to assign an envelope to the amplitude but if I try that it's going to tell me again that I'm, I'm trying to edit too many voices at once so we'll just have to select the one go to um, uh, turn amplitude all the way down yes Go to Amplitude, select Envelope 5, because I've lost count of how many envelopes we're using now. Oops. Envelope 5. Turn that all the way up. Go to Envelope 5. And introduce some delay to that. store that so we're done oops we're done with the heavy lifting um, we can now kind of edit it as we go so you can already hear that there's some delay to that LFO okay, I think it's too much isn't it Okay, 
got there in the end. So I have now successfully assigned God knows what. LFO 2 to VCO 1 and 2 and I think. And then um, assigned envelope 5 to the amount of LFO 2. Yeah? Are you following? Um, but it is important. It was important for me to get there because that's what I wanted the sound to do. So there will be a delay now um, between that vibrato coming in. So yeah, that's kind of where about so I want it and just want to tone it down a little bit, but yeah. I want to bring VCA up on the uh, patch number 44 so that it's slightly louder. Um, and we can hear that vibrato continue. And sometimes you have to change the sound um, to a place you don't want it just to be able to adjust something. Because if I can't hear the LF exactly what the LFO is doing, then I need to make it like that particular part of the preset louder so that I can adjust the LFO so I can get to where I want it and then make it quieter. Um, I suppose some people might say, well, why would you do that? Because then you, you're not really going to hear it. But um, it's just very subtle things that you do that can make all the difference to a sound. I don't think in multi-mode right now I have that pan going on as before. So um, let's click multi. Go into pan and no, I don't. Whoa, left, left one, oh, left two, right one, and then right two, left two, left one, left, right two. So um, I don't want to go too much further into it, the video's been long enough, but that gives you an idea of where I would go. I've got the total foundations, and from this point, um, generally what I do when I manufacture, uh, do presets for a manufacturer, is I will create um, 20 to 30% more than they've asked me to do, and then I will go through all of them and see which ones I really want to keep. Um, the process I've just taken you through is a lot longer because I've had to explain it, but generally speaking, I, it would take me anywhere between 10 and 20 minutes to do a preset that I was happy with. And then um, once I've done all the presets and saved them all in spaces, I will come back and what I call render them. I, you know, I'll just tweak them so that they're pleasing to my ear, having not listened to them for a while. Um, but yeah, let's have a listen to how this sound has ended up. Um, relatively happy with it, although because we've been using FM and we've assigned some tracking to the um, to the VCOs, it is a little bit unpredictable to play. And that's where I would start spending some time, which I don't want to bore you with, tweaking it so that it's consistent across the keyboard at least um, not falling out and unpleasant to the ear, which if you hit the wrong notes with this particular preset, it can be unpleasant to the ear. So you just have to hit the right notes. Do you know, I'm still not done with envelope one. <laughs> Let's do it. I want this to be more of a pad now.
Shall we, before we go, add some reverb, chorus, and delay, just to give you the idea of what this would sound like if it was embedded into a track. So, <clears throat> say for example, this is a pad, we're going to be putting it into a film. Got some reverb, delay and chorus, this is what it'll be like. So there you go, that's how you get from a basic preset to something usable. Um, sorry about the clicks and pops and crackles, I know for a fact that's my laptop struggling to deal with the uh, UAD plugins I've got on at the moment, um, instead of using a desktop or something more practical. Anyway, um, yeah that's it, I hope you enjoyed the video, I hope you got something out of it, I'm now going to spend the next two days probably editing it. Um, but yeah, thanks for joining me.